Okay. Is that? Huh? Oh yeah, we're recording now. Actually, well, we're recording in different ways, but yeah. So here's my question to back to you, Kim. So when you when we first were asked when you first were asked the question, are you an activist? And you said, uh, I don't know. Is that because what was in your vision of activist when you said that? Um, like yeah, the resistors chaining themselves to construction equipment. <laughs> it's a little extreme for me. <laughs> but then. So what I was talking about with Matt earlier is the idea that I think people generally hear the word activist, they think of that resistor type. Um, but there's a, a thing called the story of change that's developed by the story of stuff people. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, was it one of the exhibits? Yeah. The Science Center? Technically, but I learned about it way before the Marine Science Center exhibit. <laughs> Um, but the idea behind that is trying to raise, expand the definition of activism because you, even the little things that you're doing as far as teaching other people or baking cookies or whatever, you are still supporting the movement and everyone has their own place and their own strengths to be able to bring to this movement. And so um, a lot of, with the, with the thinking of it just being I'm going to resist. I think that prohibits a lot of people from really participating and really seeing themselves as active. I can make a change in the world. It's interesting. You kept on saying this movement. Like, are, are we in a movement? Yours? Okay. This movement of, yeah, protecting the. You're sort of lumping all basically yeah. good hearted people that are trying to make the world a better place. It's yeah. This wave of Yeah, I change. guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah. There was um, a random statistic that, and if you watch, I can't remember, there's two, there's two of them. There's the story of change, and then there's the story of solutions. And I can't remember which one is which that's part of that. Um, but they, they talk about how in the, Civic or the civil, wow, my brain just died. Civil rights movement, that's yeah. the word. <laughs> I was like, civil war movement? I don't think Back in the civil war. Back in the, civil war. the civil war. No, let's <laughs> not. Um, the civil rights movement, the, the belief, or like 19% of the people when polled believed that that was something that should actually happen. Um, but yet, there was a lot of change because there was active, actual or action that was involved to it. And nowadays, there's like 70%, I'm talking about particularly the environmental movement because that's where my background is in, um, but there's 70% of the people that think the environmental movement is a good thing to do, that we should care about protecting. Oh, I have to take that. All right. All right. Sorry, I gotta drop out. See you guys. Let me turn this thing off. Ah. I could kick you out, but <laughs> how do I turn this thing off? Get me out of here. Oh, um, yeah, so that last statistic. <laughs> was that 70% of the people think that the environmental movement is something that should be, it should happen, but yet there hasn't been any significant environmental, or lately there hasn't been any significant environmental push. All right. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift our topic a little bit. Go for it. Okay. Um, so I was thinking, let's talk about power. Okay. I think it, it definitely relates to activism and changing the world. It's all about power. Um, but I was going to go more personal. Like, mm -hmm. do you have, um, when I talk about power and conflicts in which you have, you, you know, have encountered power or you've encountered power trying to, um, uh, that you've actually had to personally confront mm -hmm. a power situation. It could be with a group, it could be big or small, but preferably something that you've actually like 
Um, it's actually involved words or actions. Do you have any like stories or any anything come to mind when I talk about you and being involved in our struggle of any sort? Whether it was a healing, positive one, or a really confrontational. I don't know. Yeah? That's not so hard. Well, do you, let me, let me put it this way, um, has, uh, how do you react if someone like raises their voice to you? Mm. Um, what, what sort of like, how do you, do you, do you close up or do you, mm. do you rise up? Or? I think for me, okay, in general, raising voices with a loud voice, there's a physiological reaction for me of just my heart starts pounding, I start anxiety and panic kind of raises. But um, what was your second part of that question? Just how do you? Um, how do I react? Yeah, how do you? How do I close up? Um, mm -hmm. Generally, like it takes a while. I have to absorb that. Like I, I can't react right away. I don't. Like I will just sit there. Probably, <laughs> if someone's really mad at me, I'll probably just start crying. <laughs> Truly, like I, it's hard for me to respond back in, I don't respond back with anger in, generally I don't get angry, I cry. Um, and so, but then like if I had, if it was a friend or if it was, actually no, if it was just anybody, I would take the time to separate, to get my own space, get my grounding back, and then come back to the person more calmly and try to to talk through it, to just express. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, does that work for you? Or does that? I'm working on it. <laughs> um, I think it's hard in general, like with people navigating people's different modes of communication and ways to communicate and but also like knowing this is so random because lately I've been have you ever heard of the drama triangle? Yes. Yes. So I've been reading a lot about that lately. And just trying to step out of that and not getting sucked into that drama triangle and realizing that there's, so there's the persecutor, there's the rescuer, and then there's the victim. Yeah. And within conflict or within um, a situation or whatever, you can, people can switch roles. And so like, if, say for example, if you had the change of power, right? So if you had, if you were the, same you. You were the persecutor. Yeah. You yelled at me. I then took the victim role of like, oh my gosh, how could you yell at me? That's horrible. And then um, I could either take the victim role or I could then switch and then yell back at you and then become the persecutor. And then you could choose to be the victim or the rescuer or whatever, yeah. whatever choice. But you see how that yeah. gets and, in and the a third list. person. And then the third involved. person and gets that's in. that's often where the rescuer comes in. They, yeah. they decide to mm -hmm. take on the role of somehow like, saving say, the situation. Yes, exactly. And so I, for me personally, I'm really trying to be aware and mindful of how that can play out in relationships or in, in work relationships, in personal relationships, in family relationships, all of that, figuring out how to figuring out where the power is coming from and not letting it influence you. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I learned about the power triangle taking a, uh, this uh, course for teaching mindfulness in prisons. And so, I mean, in the prison environment, it, uh, I mean, prison is like where, um, if you wanna learn about human psychology, Prison is where you, you know where you see everything happen, and you see constant you know power dynamics, and um, and so that's a very useful thing for a person mm -hmm. in, in a closed environment like that. You know, 
um, to be aware of the drama triangle and to just see drama is starting to happen and I don't have to participate in it at all. Even if it's in the room with me, I can recognize that person's playing the role of persecutor, yep. that one is being the victim, that one's being the rescuer, and I don't know if you remember exactly you know, the, the techniques, um, mm -hmm. but there's techniques to sort of like, uh, you know, I think it was basically sort of the nonviolent communication techniques. It's yeah. just like recognize that everything anyone is doing, they're trying to make their life more wonderful. Yeah. So it's like you have some sort of need or desire that you are going for, that you're using your voice about, and then you sort of see, I have my needs, and let's just see if these needs, you know, have any sort of like way to coexist. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of win-win solutions here? I think there's also, I don't know exactly how this ties in, but also validating people's experiences and not trying to, you can validate them without having to be sucked into the drama or without having to be, I don't know, where's my words? Um, without having to be sucked into the drama or without having to be saying, acquiescing, like, oh yeah, you're right, kind of thing. It's just, yes, I understand that you, that you feel that way or something. And um, being, it's similar to, yeah. Well, yeah. well I, I had a uh, I had a conversation the other day um, with a person I just met um, from a different culture than myself, and um, uh, uh, and this person be sort of like um, got was very emotional about something and was really uh, ranting mm -hmm. and opening up about this and sharing feelings about it with me, um, even though we barely know each other. But it was, um, it's like what you're saying, when someone is expressing themselves to you in a very strong way, and they may be directing a lot of emotions at you, aggressive or whatever, it is a, um, I mean, I'm still you know, learning how to best be with that. Mm -hmm. Especially it was it was particularly challenging because because we don't really know each other and and uh, this person knows I'm a politician. And that's like the only thing they know about me. And so I'm like they they like put me in this category of politician mm -hmm. which is really not my strongest identity <laughs> and character trait, yeah. wouldn't you say? I would not, agree with that's that. That's not really the main that doesn't really, you know, I'm not a typical, I'm not a typical emotional makeup of a politician or the values or anything. Um, but so, but it was hard. The person was so emotional and speaking to me and making assumptions about who I was mm -hmm. and sort of attacking me a little bit. And um, and when I what I realized, anything I said. It was like a no win. Anything I said, it was just like it was just like material to like to hit. And I was like, okay, yeah. me talking at least. I'm, I'm not things I'm choosing to say are not working yeah. for healing the situation. So I suppose that's when you go into uh, you go into like reflecting. Like I hear you saying that sometimes that does not even work. Oh, sometimes, no. sometimes that can actually. I've had that backfire. <laughs> yeah, like people get upset that you're attempting yeah. to Just to say to re say what they yeah. said, yeah. and they're like, "No, you got it wrong. You don't understand." Yeah, and I I don't know what you ended up doing, but just listening, yeah. basically, and then even worse, I had to go. I was on the phone, and I had to. You were on the phone. It was, it was on the phone, oh, and it was yeah, yeah much no, worse. Or, Nonverbal communication is huge. Yeah, and yeah. so I had to sort of try to say, I have to go to this thing, and then that sort of added to the fuel. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but we talked later and okay. got better. But those are always, I mean, intense. When someone's intense, whether they're like doing a power thing or they're they're you know raising their voice at you to try to get you to do something, or they're just they're just being intense on anything, or they're judging you, or judging a situation. Um, I mean, I always, I always feel surreal to me when I'm in a situation like that because it's like being on an amusement park ride or something. Um, the intensity and the role of the 
emotions that yeah you go through. Because I I never would at this point in my life, mm -hmm. I would never like raise my emotional intensity with another human being yeah. to like to that like to that level. Right. Unless I'm playing a sport. <laughs> I mean that's the only time I'm playing yeah. a sport. If you were playing basketball against one once another yeah. or whatever, you know, then I would um, I let myself get intense and I like my body gets intense yeah. and once in a while there are accidents happen, you know, and there are collisions and stuff, but in the ordinary course of yeah. uh, uh, us doing something, I would never raise my voice mm -hmm. to a person. I don't know if we want to go here. I don't know if I want to go here, but um, Trump is in Everett, Washington. Oh, we can go to Trump. Okay. Sure, right? No, I don't know if I want to go there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he was in Everett, Washington yesterday, and I have a lot of friends. I used to live in downtown Everett, so mm -hmm. like six blocks from where he was. And so I had a lot of friends that were posting that they went to participate in the protest um, or participate in like one of the friends actually disguised themselves like a Trump supporter and actually got to go in and they were in. Um, and like to me, every time I watch it, and that's what's hardest for me is when I watch that, I see so much of that anger and that the, exactly what you're talking about, where people are in your face yelling at you with so much emotion and so much intensity that it is really hard to to not either not want to yell back <laughs> or to just and sit with it. It's one of the hardest things I think to do. Um, every, for me, every time I hear even Trump supporters or the the anger and that. Uh, there's a word that I'm looking for, but it's not coming to me. Of just how much lack of consideration of other people and other viewpoints that happen when that intensity. That it's more about I'm right and you're wrong, and not about hey, we're both humans. Let's figure out. Like that's just boggles my mind because I'm that's where I am in my essence is always seeing both sides and being able to be the natural mediator. I think mediator is one of those actually. Oh, mediator. Maybe I don't yeah. know. Um, we'll add it. Just make a mediator. I can make my own yeah. there. Um, but just always being able to see both sides and the humanity that's lost of like I don't know, like I said, I don't know if I'm well, gonna go there because it's intense and it boils up inside me. Yeah. Well I don't think elections are elections for like presidential candidates or any sort of candidate. They aren't uh, they aren't events that I think really help uh, communities mm -hmm. solve problems or anything. Right. They yeah. just sort of it, there's it's a way of, yeah, they sort of create sides, yeah. and then you try to make your side win. And Trump is you know, creating, he just created this really edge, it's a really powerful edge mm -hmm. in, um, and he in particular is, he just like attracts the most voracious, you know, types of people mm -hmm. to that edge. And so, um, it might, I think it might be healthy for our society yeah. instead of having like a lot of the beliefs and values that we um, that some of which we think maybe are pretty ugly. Instead of those being like beneath the surface, hidden under yes. code language yeah. and code words, Absolutely. it's totally out there. Yep. And so we're just like looking at it, and dealing with it. It's not fun, but it might be it might be healthy I for us. So. Yeah, yeah, and it's hard because like being on that. Being on that mediator, like can see both sides and seeing this. I'm also a system thinker, like, I can see how everything interrelates and really, yeah, seeing how one action can ripple and down to another action and how all of that. But 
that so I can see and I get frustrated with the system but I can see how Trump supporters have gotten that way they have feel just like at a loss that their country is giving them all this crap and that they see someone that connects with what they're feeling inside it just fuels and builds up to it and so that's I don't I don't disparage but I don't think that the Trump supporters are bad I think they're just I can see how it happens and it's sad for me <laughs> I think that's mostly what happens is I'm sad that that is the way that things are falling through yeah I, mean, I think they're just an, uh, just another side of the populist movement that's growing. There's the Bernie Sanders yeah. left-wing populist oh, yeah. movement, and then there's this right-wing yeah. populist movement, and they're both coming out of massive discontent with the yes. power, the way power works in our country, realizing exactly. these two parties uh, yeah, know, they really, control them. Yeah. And, they're, and then it's just sort of like, um, I mean, it was, I feel like this was an incredibly exciting primary season that we had non-establishment candidates yeah. just Throw rebellions in both parties. That's, one actually yeah. won. Um, no idea where it goes from here, <laughs> and it's kind of it's kind of unfortunate that a that the mainstream establishment candidate won on the Democratic side, but the, the radical right wing candidate won on the left side because the establishment candidates are very flawed mm -hmm. because part of the establishment and part of that whole power yeah. structure and the status quo. One of the things that I hope and goes back for me to the come back full circle of the change makers mm -hmm. is that like Bernie's that revolution and that that movement, you know, say, mm -hmm. really highlighted the concerns that the, from the progressive movement and realizing and one of the things that I want that is really important to me out there is making sure that people, just because Bernie didn't win um, the primary, that that doesn't stop them or prevent them from still making the change. Because the awareness, I hope, is out there and more and more building that awareness and realizing that we are the change makers. <laughs> that it's not going to be placed in some hero of like, oh, Bernie was going to save us all. I mean, that's what happened with Obama, right? With Obama being the hope. He's our hope, he's gonna save us all. But he's only, he can only do so much. And we are the ones that really have the power and should have the power to be able to make the change. And so um, participating in activism, however way you perceive it, um, whatever works for you, whatever works there for you, I will always be an educator. I will not see me on the front lines. But I did, um, totally other random note, I did back about four years ago, four or five years ago, I got to interview Julia Butterfly Hill. Um, and she was the one that uh, lived in a tree, in a redwood tree for two years. Wow. <laughs> um, That's for a commitment. That's a commitment. And she is just an amazing person as far as she's like, I didn't, I wasn't, she says it herself. I didn't think I would. I was an activist. I didn't ever consider it. This was just like I did this. I did it little steps, and she didn't. Her intention was not. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go live in a tree for two years to to protest this. It was just through happenstance, through steps, and what life led for her. Mm -hmm. um, and she was really fun to interview because she talks a lot about. Um, that sustainability being environmental and social justice and really connecting the two together. Um, and also realizing that um, that everyone has their own personal choice and what that works for them. Like she doesn't expect everyone to go and climb trees to protect. She also sees that that everyone has their own 
different way of participating as long as you're actively participating in yeah. the movement. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the reasons I like the question. It's so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. It's good. There's lots of movements, you know. Going on. <laughs> I move. But one of the reasons I like um, to ask the word, are you an activist, or yeah. do you consider yourself an activist, is there is this, a lot of people have this resistance to saying yes. And so then, um, but I, I sort of feel like, you know, if, if you're trying to change the world mm -hmm. in a positive way, in any significant way that's beyond just your life, you're taking action to change the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, so it's just sort of like a judgment call what you do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just important that everyone, um, everyone that cares is keeping their mind open and their eyes open to opportunities mm -hmm. to do things. And you just never know where it'll take you. You know, if your eyes, and that's really, it's one of the reasons I, I title this podcast The Mindful Activist, because mindfulness is, is just practice of actually having your eyes open mm -hmm. or your attention open. And when you're mindful in any moment, mm -hmm. you see more paths from that moment. Mm -hmm. You see more options, more possibilities. And and I think maybe maybe activism in our country is a bit of a rut in terms of figuring out how you change things. Mm -hmm. And one of the ruts is thinking, elect an awesome guy mm -hmm. president and you're gonna change the world. You know, it's like that well, that might be one piece of it, but it's certainly it's like not the place to invest all your energy and hopes is into even if you win, like yeah. you said, with Obama, yeah. he's still stuck in an incredibly mm -hmm. corrupt machine. Right. Um, you got to change the whole thing. You have to like have pressure on every point, and you have to be creative because the system is built to allow you to put activist pressure in certain ways and they like want it in those ways. They're like, please do a petition and okay. get lots of signatures and use that as your form of activism. They're like, we love that because we can, we're so, we so know how to ignore that, you know? Or please run candidates for offices. As long as you don't get too many, yeah. they don't, you don't need to care about that. Yeah. And then, you know, it's like, uh, so you're really creative. Yeah, and raising awareness about all those different mechanisms or or ways like yes i can write a petition and i can sign a petition or whatever or i can just choose not to support and i think and yeah not buying products, yeah, not or buying yeah. products. you know there's a lot more power you have a lot more power and influence i think than people realize and they're willing to just give it up to put the hopes in like this savior complex of, yeah. hey, I'm Obama president or whoever, Trump. I mean, they have the same thing. Like, Trump is going to save them. They have that same viewpoint of they're going to, Trump is going to help me get out of, get a job. But that's not, it's a matter of participating actively mm -hmm. in the system mm -hmm. to try to change the system. Yeah. No, it's true. And I, I noticed this a lot when I was uh, helping stir up the Occupy movement in, in this community. Um, that, you know, you like reach out to your friends, you tell them what you're doing, and you realize people have this choice of how do they support something they believe in. And the simplest way is money. Mm -hmm. Actually, the simplest, easiest way is what if I throw $5 or $10 or whatever towards this cause? Um, and then, you know, it's sort of like, you basically put every action you can take, even the ones that are that people know about, on a spectrum, and they ba I basically measure them by how much time it takes. Mm -hmm. Like how much take, time does it take you to donate some money? That's one level of action, it's like five minutes. Mm -hmm. But then how much time does it take to write a letter to the editor? You know, That's like another investment of time. And it's a little more vulnerable, you're putting yourself out there. Um, but still, maybe an hour or two. And then another level is if you're like being invited to events, rallies, you could actually go with your physical self and go and learn about it or support it. And that's another level of commitment of time. Um, and then of course there's like, um, uh, you know, there's, if you want a, 
a law change or you want something to happen, you could actually go to city council or the county commissioners and try to talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, or you could try to speak at public comment, um, or you want to get crazy, you're just insane, you really want to make change, you could run for office, you know? And uh, then you're like, you know, get to talk about your issues for months and months and months um, while you're campaigning. And anyways, um, and then that, those are all things people know about. And those are creative things. I think as you were talking, what came up for me was the that discouragement that people could feel as well of like what is my action how is that really going to make a difference if i go to a rally and i hold a picket sign or if i go to uh, write that letter to the editor how much of a difference is it really going to make and i don't have the answer to that i really don't it's a longer topic than yeah. this but i think it's something to be aware of it's like i know a lot of people who feel so discouraged by the system that they don't even want to vote they don't even want to register to vote because yeah. there's so much, well, what is it gonna really matter in the long run? And that I have my moments of like that. Oh yeah. Well, I mean I absolutely. Yeah. We're so disempowered yeah. because all those things I just named, yeah, they do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> they basically accomplish nothing except the running for office. I mean, that's when but I think then you're of, still of, within of, the system and then it's well, weird. It's it's still it's gonna make some but change, but I would say but of all the things I've done yeah. as an activist. Um, I would actually say, I mean, the two most extreme things you can do that stir things up the most are running for office or doing something in media, like literally start, like starting your own show or something. Those are like, um, you know, those are like really, but they're in a way they're just putting max amount of time. You know, it's like changing the world is like, um, it's about changing the story, changing what we're talking about. And the only way you can do that is if you're telling a story mm -hmm. and you tell a story if you're running for office, you tell a story if you're on media, you write a book, you just basically start talking and you're telling the story nonstop and trying to get people to hear the story. And, and then the choice is, well, but then the choice is, are you going to be the only storyteller? Like, it's my story. Listen to me. Everyone just repeat my story. And then you're like, now you're being like a political leader or is there a way to... And I guess that's what I'm trying to do is like, I want to like help grab control of the story, but I don't want it to be my voice. I want it to be like thoughtful, interesting people mm -hmm. at any numbers coming together and sharing. Let's retell the story mm -hmm. of what's going on right now and tell it honestly and let's be respectful. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's kind of what I'm doing. This conversation helps her clarify that. <laughs> Yay! Um, Let's see. Uh, so we we've done that. We've done like almost an hour. Um, is there anything? This is a fun, been a fun conversation. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed. Didn't know where we'd go with it since you know when we were doing our planning session. <laughs> we like planned this like, episode. <laughs> we totally planned. It yeah. took us like good two hours to plan. Lots of time. Lots of time. Maybe two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. More like yeah. But. Um, but I like where we went. It was fun, yeah. and it was another good test. We got we got, a, got a drop in, and that was interesting. And we have lots of video going, and we'll get better at figuring out how to do this. And we'll actually promote it more to see if uh, if uh, people drop in and see what's going on. Um, uh, anything else you want to say to the world before you you sign off on your first appearance on the on Blackfish? I'm unemployed and need a job. <laughs> and oh, do you have a website or anything you want to, or a Twitter or anything like that for? Uh, they can always contact the show. If like, contact the hire. show. I'm still working on on getting a website, mm -hmm. done. but it's it's coming together. Yeah. But contact the show and then you can contact me. And so I have lots yeah. of great thoughts. You like shared your whole name. Do you want to Amy say? Johnson. I think I did so. Okay. Yeah. Amy Johnson, thank you for being a guest. That was really fun. Uh, thank you, anyone that watches, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Uh, you can catch this on uh, the Global Consensus Project org or at hive one net. You can follow us on follow it on Facebook, the Mindful Activist.
and uh, say fitter. Fitter. I'm fitter. <laughs> fitter. Yep. All right. So All right. we'll we'll stop everything now. All right. Bye. bye. That one that stops. And this is just the, the meeting, and no one's in there, so it's not. Oh, but it's recording still, so. <laughs>